Hey there, REM PCs. Welcome to Rules of Cool, where we interview very special guests, creators, gamers, designers, and world builders. I'm your host, Rem, and today we'll be speaking with Green Ronin once again, once again about their amazingly successful crowdfunding campaign on Backerkit, fifth season. That's right, this is the RPG based on N.K. Jemison's multiple Hugo award-winning Broken Earth trilogy. We'll be talking with Green Ronin's founder, Chris Premis, and writer and developer for fifth season, Hiromi Kota. Stay tuned because you won't want to miss it. Type hashtag RemPC in the chat today for your free entry to win to uh, win a copy, excuse me, of Green Ronin's PDF of the Blue Rose Core Rulebook. If you like romantic fantasy, this is the TTRPG for you. Don't forget you can get bonus entries to win by subscribing and donating bits through the Twitch chat. Every 100 bits gets you a bonus entry and subscribing gets you seven whole bonus entries. In Rem Alternus news, Subversion, the new cyberpunk fantasy TTRPG by Fragging Unicorns Games is coming soon to Kickstarter. Build your community and subvert authority at every turn in this gritty Neo-Babylon setting. Follow the project now before it goes live at the link in the chat. Exit Vector is the aerial combat minis game coming to Kickstarter this year. Give your pilots some much deserved attention if you use this rules-like game on its own or as part of your cyberpunk role-playing game. Get your rigor on with Exit Vector and follow the link in chat to check out the project. Don't forget to enter your email. And finally, Well of the Worlds is coming to Kickstarter on April 4th from Mobius Worlds Publishing. Powered by Prowlers and Paragons Ultimate Edition, this TTRPG setting transports characters into a new fantasy world where they discover that they have powers they didn't have in their home world. Inspired by Japanese isekai portal fantasy stories, this is a world of adventure for your, you to explore. Learn more by visiting the link in chat and following the project. Now, time to get right into our conversation for this week, so stay tuned, REM PCs. Welcome back, everyone, and welcome to my guests, uh, returning guest, Chris, Chris Pramis. I almost said Chris Kramis. It's I'm just, a, I'm just a, a, a mess today here. I'm switching everything up. And our first time guest today, Hiromi Kota. Nice to meet you. Uh, nice to be here. Thanks for having us. Welcome to the show. I'm very excited to talk to you about your Kickstarter today, but we got some, some get to know you stuff to get out of the way first. So Chris has been on the, the show before, but I wanted to ask Hiromi, uh, what is your history as a gamer? Uh, so uh, my uncle Mark uh, got me into D&D &D, like when I was uh, real little. Uh, and then like my dad got me into the uh, old school uh, War of the Ring uh, board game. Mm. Um I was far too young to understand the War of the Ring board game. Uh, it's a very complicated, very crunchy game. Uh, I don't know if I would understand it now. <laughs> um, I like it. <laughs> it I, I liked it. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but yeah. <laughs> uh, and like um, with uh, that kind of background, like um, one thing that I like see people saying or um, is like, it's good to see POCs in games. There needs to be more representation. And like that's true. But uh insert samurai in uh game changer gif here. We've been here the whole time. <laughs> uh like my uncle Mark's black, and he got me started with the magenta box, like not even red box, like with the ugly art on the cover. Uh if you drew the art, I'm sorry. Uh I apologize. <laughs> um but you know it's true. Uh, 
Uh, and my dad is a very brown uh, Okinawan, yeah, yeah, Mexican American. So like, uh, yeah, no, uh, we they got me started real early. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, and and so gaming, you know, world building and creation and stuff. It's an easy pathway to get into writing. But how did you first start as a writer? Um, like I think. Like a lot of uh, RPG writers, uh, my path into RPG writing was real weird. Uh, like I started my professional writing career uh, as a journalist uh, for Jive Magazine. Oh wow! Uh, and so I was uh, reviewing music, uh, both like CDs and live uh, uh, video games, uh, films. Like I. Oh, I actually started there as a uh, columnist uh, who was probably meaner to people than anyone. No, definitely meaner to people than anyone deserved to be uh, like spoken to. Uh, and that was that was actually why they hired me, because they thought that like, oh, uh, ed edgy content that uh, is somewhat clever. It'll it'll bring uh, eyeballs to uh, our magazine which was kind of true but like i was mean and oh. <laughs> uh and then uh about seven years uh i got into uh rpg writing um uh through um uh Seder, uh brucato uh or phil brucato um uh working on uh mage the ascension with uh no 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 helmet stay uh, can just reach on the bookshelf behind them that's great uh with uh gods and monsters uh, which was uh loads of fun awesome um and then chris you are a returning guest with us so tell mm -hmm. us tell us the story of how you managed to get the rights to produce the fifth season rpg yeah um well, um, I read the novels um, on the recommendation of uh, a couple people on our team, um, Joe Carricker and, and James Gates, who was our editor at the time. Um, and uh, they thought it would be an interesting thing to license. And I read the books and I agreed. So, <laughs> um, so basically, uh, we went to Nora, gave her a pitch. Um, and, uh, she was quite receptive. So, uh, you know, so some negotiating was required, but we sorted things out. Um, and yeah, we, we've had the license for several years, but we're, the game is finally here. So awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. And, and Hiromi, how did you get pulled into green Ronin and, and the project? Um, so, um, there was kind of a, uh, call for writers um and i i had known about the books i um had received multiple friends saying this is up your alley and you should read them uh, and when the call came out it was like okay well now i have to read them mm -hmm. uh and i just binged all three of them uh in rapid succession i'm like yeah no i i need i i need to throw my hat in the ring for this um and i think having a few books under my belt at that point uh, was uh, a good uh, mark in my favor. Probably didn't hurt uh, that I also knew Jane Gates and Joe Carriker. <laughs> <laughs> hey, contacts, uh, you know, so how things happen. It's, yeah. it's a small gaming world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. And um, I think at that point, uh, I had actually uh, worked on a few uh, Green Dronin books. Um, Actually, I'm not. I'd have to check when, when, what project started when, mm. um, but definitely published before now. Uh, my uh, modern age uh, adventure, uh, Flight 1701, uh, and uh, Cthulhu Returns. Ooh. There's Awakens. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, Awakens. <laughs> <laughs> this, awesome. this is what happens when projects over. I just brain duck. <laughs> Time is hard. It's uh, it's hard to keep track of. Uh, yeah. 
So how much have both of you gotten to collaborate with N.K. Jemison on this project? Uh, well, so I've been working with her throughout because, um, you know, I established a relationship with her and I've, I'm the primary point of contact. So, you know, for both business stuff and, and also, um, you know, asking her uh, world questions and developer questions and, and that sort of stuff. Um, and uh, she's been great, very responsive um, and, uh, you know, very willing to uh, to let other people, um, you know, tell their own stories in the stillness, which is what the setting is called. I I love that you got to collaborate with uh, with N.K. Jemison directly instead of like through degrees of separation and stuff like that. That's really cool to be able to do. Um, I also am getting much attention because I just hid the squeaky toy that was going off from the dogs behind me. And so now they're very interested in me. <laughs> so, uh, apologies for that. Um, so, always, so, well, go ahead. Oh, it's always nice to be able to work directly with the creator, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, when we were doing our, our Game of Thrones RPG, A Song of Ice and Fire role playing, you know, I was talking to George, you know, um, and uh, uh, he wasn't quite as Johnny on the spot as Nora because he had some things going on. But um, yeah, I, you know, I didn't have to. Um, I wasn't talking to like a licensing agent or something like that. So sure. Nice. That's really cool. Yeah. Oh, neat. Um, so tell us tell us about the system. Like, let's let's I want to get into the world and more with uh, what. And K has provided versus what you have contributed to the world and stuff like that. But how, um, what, what's, what is the system like? Um, well, I'll talk about the age system in general, and then I'll tag Harumi in, and they can talk about um, uh, what we've done with fifth season specifically. Um, so the adventure game engine or age, uh, is a rule system that I originally designed for our dragon age tabletop RPG. Um, and the whole idea of that project was that I wanted to take, um, video gamers and show them how cool tabletop was. Um, and so I didn't want a system that was going to be onerous to learn and, you know, complicated. Um, I, I wanted something more intuitive. So that game came out and, uh, you know, people really liked it. And a lot of people were like, man, I love this system, you know, but do you have anything that's not tied to this setting? Um, and then we were like, sure, we can do that. <laughs> and that led to... <laughs> That led to Fantasy Age, which was kind of the, the more generic version of those rules. But then since then, uh, Modern Age, uh, The Expanse, uh, second edition of Blue Rose uh, is also Age. Um, so it's uh, basically, it's, it's a system where you got a bunch of abilities um, that are generally rated like zero to five. And when you're going to do something, you roll three six-sided dice. Uh, add them together and add your ability. Um, there are also things called focuses, which are kind of, um, uh, well, kind of like skills, I guess, you know, that you're particularly focused in, in one area. Specialties so, uh, or yeah. expertise. Yeah. So you might have, you know, dexterity with a focus in acrobatics, say. Mm. Um, and uh, you get a little bump for that as well. Um, so that's all easy, you know, like almost every role in the game, um, apart from damage is using that system. Um, but then like the special sauce of age is, uh, what's called the stunt system. Um, so this started as kind of a dynamic critical hit system, um, for dragon age, uh, where base basically if you roll your three dice, um, there's one of them that's uh, a different color. We call that the stunt die or the drama die in some games. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so if you roll and you succeed and you get doubles on any of the three dice, that means that you ha have generated stunt points. Um, and then you look at a kind of menu of stunts and you spend all your points. You know, you can mix and match as you like. And then you kind of narrate like the cool thing that you just pulled off. Cool. Um, so 
that started with just combat stunts, but people really liked it in playtest. And so that led to the addition of, uh, of spell stunts. And then, uh, you know, we wanted stunts for not just uh, combat encounters. So there's uh, role-playing stunts and there's also exploration stunts um, and other kinds that have grown up like for chases and, and other things. It's, um, it's it sounds like there's a lot of tables to look at to spend these points, but I really like the idea of the flavor for like the the critical hit where it's more than just like, oh, your arrow hit them extra hard and right in an artery. Like you get double damage, but like this yeah. can add more to it. And I really like that flavor. Yeah. Uh, way back when uh, my wife, Nicole, uh, invented something called the axe tackle, which was basically, uh, you know, she spent the stun uh, stunt points with her two-handed axe to both uh, inflict extra damage on them, you know, and knock them back and prone. So that our shorthand for that became axe tackle. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, that's great. Checks yeah. Out. So yeah, there there so are there? a lot of choices. Um, so it helps if you as a player uh, beforehand like have looked at the stunts and have some ideas about ones that you like and would want to use. So to clarify, is age green Ronin's system then? Yes. Oh, cool. That's that's awesome. I didn't know you guys had your own system for, um, I, I, I learned something today. This is an <laughs> educational show. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah it's, really cool. uh, it's become our house system, really. Uh, you know, the only other major system we have is Mutants and Masterminds which is over 20 years old and going strong. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, our forthcoming Cthulhu Awakens game, that's going to let us do uh, horror stuff. And basically we're exploring different genres uh, with the core of the rules, but then each game has bespoke elements to uh, better reflect genres uh, or in this case, uh, a literary setting. So uh, tag, oh, awesome. you're in. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, now, yeah, wrote, how does it um how does age kind of play into how did you cater it to um to fifth season? Um I'm going to uh tangent real fast. Uh oh, sure, and sure. uh uh you you brought up uh the very real, real concern that I suppose uh some folks might have at this point that uh because uh there's a bunch of stunts with a bunch of cool things that you can do that you might be like, ah, I don't want a bunch of tables. I don't want to like dig through rules. Uh, but like uh, the quick start, there's a player reference page, which is like two pages front and back printed out. It's got all of the stunts that you need right there, as well as a little bit of uh, backstory and whatnot. So cool. if if you're if you're playing uh, the quick start, uh, then like just so hand that to players, hand them the character sheets, and they're kind of good. So you can have kind of the 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 short, sweet diet set, or you mm -hmm. can have tables for days, depending on your play style. Yeah. And cool. the quick start okay. is a is a free PDF. So you could Ooh. download it as you watch if you wanted to. Um, awesome. Yeah. Mm. Neat. Yeah. Uh and um for the how uh the age system kind of uh uh got tailored over to uh fit fifth season. One of the like coolest things that that's uh, we have going on over there, or one of the things that I like the best anyway, is that kind of like sets the tone for the game within the core system. Before you create a character, uh, you and the rest of your gaming group sit down and you create a com. Uh, the com is basically the uh, town, city, village, uh, with whatever scale of. Uh, um, um, settlement hometown that you have it and you you decide like collaboratively what happened uh what kind of a town it is and then how your players uh, how your characters fit into it and what the last year has been like and mm -hmm. how your characters interacted with that so before you even start like uh choosing how to um uh, specialize uh your characters and like what what cast you want to be and all that like you understand how your characters fit into the setting and they have a place within it which is pretty important to uh the setting as a whole yeah. uh, as well as the game because it is very much focused on home 
uh, and belonging and taking care of uh, your neighbors because the the setting uh, can be extremely mean. Um, the the idea is that uh, well, one of the ideas uh, is that uh, Father Earth is sort of this to call him a deity is not quite right, but also not quite wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and he is he's mad at humanity for reasons that you learn in the novels and the completely justified anger, uh, but it's excessive. And so he'll crack open volcanoes, uh, uh, earthquakes, all kinds of uh, tectonic uh, uh, horrible, <laughs> horribleness. And within uh, that creates uh, what are it's called fifth seasons uh, instead of having a normal uh, spring, four, summer, fall, right? Four winter, season cycle. Okay. You you end up with a season that is not any of those, and it might last years. Where because of the sort of cataclysm, the the uh, apocalypse, if you want, it it changes life uh, throughout the entire stillness, throughout the entire continent. And you don't have to play a uh, fifth season during a fifth season. Uh, you can play it when things are tough, but not quite so uh, horrific. Uh, okay. But you can also play during a season where things, uh, where survival becomes less of a, well, we'll, we'll just make sure that we uh, don't get beat up by bandits and make sure that we take care of our water into, even if we do everything right, we might die anyways. So we got to work really, really hard. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That whole, so cycle, <laughs> um, that whole cycle is basically like reordered society. So um, basically you're always prepping for the next disaster because you know one's going to come. Um, and that's why the comms work like they do. You know, they divide people into what are called use casts. Um, and it's basically, how can you be useful to our community? Um, so uh, this version of age doesn't have classes, um, but you do have use casts. So like strong backs are, you know, they're like, the strong people who can fight and protect the village. Um, and uh, there's a leadership cast and other things like that. Um, okay. So that helps to to guide your character when you're creating them. Neat. I, and I love what you're talking about with the, the like taking a session to build a community. And I, I think that's almost like a session zero where it's like, what kind of game do you want to play? Like build your mm -hmm. world and your, your community together. And like, that will help set up or or identify some of the challenges you might face. Mm -hmm. um, so that way you could have a, like if you want a game that's heavily steeped in racism or something like that, you could. Um, and that could be one of the things that you know you're gonna battle if you build a character that um, that is gonna have hardship with that. Mm -hmm. Or you could be like, hey, that's not my kind of thing. I really just wanna focus on prepping for the next disaster and like exploring this world and stuff like that, then you could, build that community to allow you to do that a little more, which is really neat. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love um, that. The calm is really like a character in and of itself. And actually there's rules for how you generate your calm. And so it has its own like record sheet where you track various aspects of it. And that changes during play, depending on what the player characters do. Um, okay. Yeah. So. Neat. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, so we talked a little bit about uh, the about age and about um, kind of the system of fifth season. Can we take a, we, we start getting into some of the lore. So let's take a step back because um, I, I told you guys before the show, I have not read the books yet. Mm -hmm. um, I have a list of like 200 books now to le read because of guests on this show. And now I have three more. Um, so tell us about the Broken Earth trilogy and what is it? What is it about? Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I guess I'm talking, so I'll just keep talking. Okay. Yeah. Um, sure. uh, so the, the novels kind of just start off with, um, 
uh, a a young girl who is being uh, taken away by, uh, from her uh, her parents uh, to be trained to be uh, an origin, uh, uh, a person who has. Um, so uh, sorry. <laughs> In, in the stillness, uh, everyone has uh, an organ, like a sensory organ, like the uh, the brainstem uh, called uh, sensipina. It, it's basically a way for people to detect uh, seismic activity. With most people, it's extremely limited. Like it's only enough that you can f- you can sense an earthquake before you can feel it physically, which is basically not enough to save you unless you're really fast right it's uh, almost like when you feel like a storm coming because your joints get painful or something like that like that kind of sense of what's coming mm-hmm. okay yeah uh, and with origins uh theirs is much stronger to the point where they can uh basically like um sense what's underground to like uh to varying degrees as well as to use their sort of ability to sense and uh reach out to the earth to um uh shape it to uh they're i hesitate to call them geomancers because geomancer has very specific uh divinatory (laughs) um uh practices but like it's they they're not earthbenders from <laughs> <Avatar. Yeah. laughs> but, if, but if you're familiar with earthbenders from avatar you're in the right ballpark uh, <laughs> a, a significant difference between those is that uh origins also have the ability to sort of um move heat from one place to the other which is extremely valuable in like uh quieting down a volcano or what have you it also has the unfortunate or fortunate side effect of if they're not well trained uh they can freeze everyone around them and they just then they just and those people just die uh and that is one of the reasons why uh the character the the young girl at the beginning is being taken from her parents who sold her out uh so that she can be trained to not just ice everyone uh, and then we learn more about how origins are trained and how they are kind of tr- treated much in the same way as um mutants as, as like x-men uh Hi. where society fears and hates them and to a certain degree recognizes that they're essential for survival right um and so it's a lot about trying to find a place to fit in to find family and at the at the second novel and i guess towards the end of the first it literally becomes about finding family uh because it's kind of a matter of, hey, my kid got kidnapped because they're an origin. They got taken away from me. Now I need to go find her. And it's, there are a lot of problems. There's a lot of matter of injustices, like Mm -hmm. uh, origins are, they're conscripts. Uh, They don't get a choice. Uh, And if they choose to not get trained, then they are just, outlaws kill kill on site like mm. there it is very much a problematic society it's very much a society where there's significant d- differences socioeconomically like the further you get from the equatorials the the center of the stillness the further you get from prosperity and uh technology like the tech technology in uh the equatorials you've got solar power you've got geothermal power you've got um telegraphs you've got refrigerators all all that good stuff and then as you get further away from that you start kind of going back to like torches and outhouses like there's a sharp (laughs) distinction between haves and have-nots yeah okay all right that's fair and, okay and then the haves live in in an area that is uh more tech 
tectonically stable. Um, but as you move away from that, things become less tectonically stable. I, I love the, I love the details and like the little comparisons where it's like some living upstream, you know, and stuff like that. Like mm -hmm. that's that's really fascinating. Cool. Yeah, there's some um, very very deep world building that uh, Nora did, and uh, it's it's quite cool. Neat. Okay, so um, you've gotten to collaborate uh, with uh, with Nora and Kay Jemison. So, um, what else can we exp expect to find and explore within this world uh, that that you've made for TTRPG? That is kind of a callback to the books. Um, is there any specific parts where you're like, oh, this one chapter, we're definitely putting that like a reference to that in the book or anything like that? Um, well, so the game isn't about replicating the story of the novels because right. that's a specific and unique story, um, you know, based around certain characters. Um, we more set up a framework, you know, where you can have your own stories within the stillness. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you'll see things that you recognize from the novel uh, or novels, I should say. Um, but um, you're not really interacting with those events per se. Uh, okay. So it's kind of, is it happening in the same timeline then? Or is it... Um... It's, it's up to you, really. Okay. Um, yeah, I think... So you have options of, to do either. Uh, yeah, I think like kind of by default, in, in as far as there is a default, uh, it's set a little bit before uh, mm -hmm. the novels so that you kind of get a, a choice. You can uh, you can have a kind of normal life where you're trying to figure out like how how to live in the stillness. And then you could also just live in a uh, fifth season where uh, everything wrong that can go wrong does. Fair. <laughs> Okay. Neat. All right. Um, yeah. Now, now you guys chose made a a, a, a unique decision, um, and you went with Factor Kit instead of Kickstarter for crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. um, why why make that choice? Were, were you concerned at all about like the following that Kickstarter has versus Factor Kit, or what what kind of went into that decision? Um, well, basically, a couple of years back when Kickstarter announced that they were going to put everything on the blockchain and all that sort of stuff like we were immediately uneasy <laughs> about those developments um and they've they've um kind of reeled that back in but you know that did start us looking for viable alternatives and uh we decided to try backer kits because backer kits started as a way to provide services that kickstarter won't um, and so if you have backed other Kickstarters, particularly gaming Kickstarters, you know, backer kit, you've used mm -hmm. it a lot of, many times, you know, to manage your pledge and other things. So when they announced the, uh, the crowdfunding aspects, you know, it was very interesting to me because, uh, that, you know, they wouldn't have be having to prove themselves to lots of people like they're in, they're a known entity and they have a long reach because, you know, thousands and thousands of people have have used it before um you know, on on other uh crowdfunders so uh so yeah we decided um that that we would give it a shot and awesome it's going well great yeah so you're happy with uh with like the options for setting up the kickstarter and everything that goes into it I'm asking uh, totally not because I'm interested in future projects. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you have to, uh, well, first of all, it's still technically in beta. So they're, they're still building out some features and things. Okay. Um, but if you're used to dealing with Kickstarter, there sometimes you'll run into a spot where you're like, oh, surely, you know, like it works like this. and But it doesn't because... <laughs> <laughs> it's different um but overall it was very easy to use um, cool okay and they're right. they're very helpful on the marketing side of things uh as well and you know we've gotten a lot of individual attention from the people at backer kit directly uh you know as opposed to kickstarter where like you never talk to a person yeah. <laughs> yeah no interesting okay i really like that and and you have so you have your crowdfunding you have your marketing and you have your pledge manager all in one place 
Yep. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the Kickstarter. So you've still got how many days left? Seven. Seven days left. So final week here. Mm -hmm. um, you guys are over, it was over $150,000 the last time I looked. Yep. Uh, so let's let's talk a little bit about your setup for that. What rewards can people expect to find uh, on the back of your page? Um, well, so the core of it is that there are four different editions of the game, depending on what you want. So there's a PDF edition, there's a Roll20 edition, um, there is a kind of st the standard print version, which will also go into game stores and through distribution and bookstores and things. Um, and then there is a special edition, which is a, a crowdfunder exclusive. So that's, you know, the, the fancier version version with, uh, you know, cool cover and bookmark and things like that. Um, and the pledge levels, basically, uh, you're kind of mixing and matching those, um, so, I mean, you can buy the PDF uh, then like through add-ons if you want to, to add something else you could, or there are some specific pledge levels. Like there's one where you just get both of the print editions of the book. Um, so you get a standard one to play with and a you know, special edition to look nice on your shelf. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's like the most popular tier. Uh, okay. So, uh, but we also have a, a special tier um, called the N.K. Jemison Book Plate Bundle, where uh, Nora agreed to sign um, 500 book plates, um, and it's a $150 pledge, um, and that gives you um, uh, the PDF, uh, the standard edition, and the special edition, and then this signed book plate. Awesome. Um, and there's still more than 100 of those left, so, um, you know, Take your chance. <laughs> that's really cool. Yeah. That's a, that's a, I like that setup of rewards. I like the 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 Kickstarter exclusive for the special Kickstarter or not Kickstarter backer kit edition. Uh, gosh, it's like habit. It's ingrained in me. Yeah, uh, that's hard. Yeah. <laughs> so you get the backer kit exclusive, um, and then uh, the limited reward is such a, a a cool idea, and especially with um, with with her work and and. I, I, one of the, we, we have a list that we go through for uh, marketing of a crowdfunding campaign. And there's been several where it's like, this is a stream that's solely about uh, N.K. Jemison's uh, Broken Earth trilogy and and stuff like that. So it's really cool to see this kind of come to life and, and when there's such a following for it. Um, so cool, we have those rewards. Now tell me a little bit about the stretch goals, like which ones have been reached and what is still to come? Oh, well, let me pull that up. <laughs> now it's play time for the puppies. So I've got yeah. a tail wagging next to me here. Uh, okay, the stuff that we have unlocked so far, uh, the first thing was a poster map of the stillness that will now uh, be in uh, both of the print books. Um, Let's see. Uh, then we uh, we unlocked um, a, uh, a game moderators kit. Uh, if you've played or seen other of our age games, um, these are what we would call a GM's kit or uh, or a narrator's kit. So it's like a hardback screen, um, a bunch of stunt reference cards that you can share on the table, which are super handy yeah. <laughs> uh, in play. Um, and then uh, uh, we also unlocked oh, an adventure to go in that. Uh, Ruin Under by Nell Raban. Um, it's really then, cool. Yeah. Um, then there's uh, uh, a free PDF supplement called Calms of the Stillness, which is basically you know, short descriptions of a bunch of different comms that GMs can grab um, to, you know, if they want to fill out the area around cool. the comm. So there's a bunch of ideas for that. Um, and then uh, we added a second complete adventure to the core rule book called Miroc Festival by Alice Rendell. Uh, and then the last one was the Calm Creation Folio, which is another free PDF um, that serves as like a guide and a and like a record sheet for your uh, for building and maintaining your calm. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Neat. Um, 
The next one. Uh, do, do, do. So this is the next one to come. Yeah. Between so at one hundred hundred and sixty thousand uh, dollars, it's people of the stillness. Um, so this is like uh, fifty NPCs from across the use casts. Um, so it basically gives the GM a, like a ready supply of, of named characters with some backgrounds, although not stats because that would take up a lot of space. <laughs> um, but again, you know, something that's super handy in play. Um, we're that's where we are. Seven k away from that. Yeah. That's hey, we we can hit that. We can <laughs> definitely hit that. And is anything posted for beyond that? Because usually, you know, the last three days are yeah are pretty big. Uh, not yet, but um, but there will be. I, I like that too. It's like all right, let's yeah. let's let's see how we go, so that we, we can <laughs> um, like we have ideas, but let's see what we actually need to to use and and come to uh, fruition here. So yeah. Well, one of the uh, hard lessons that I've learned through crowdfunding um, is to limit the number of stretch goals that actually affect the the rule book itself, um, you know, that you have designed already. Right, right. <laughs> uh, be because if you have to add a whole bunch of things, then, they, you know, they have to be written, developed, edited, laid out, da-da-da, and it, it's just going to delay the whole core book. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. And costs go up too for extra art and writing and everything else. Yeah. Just to fill everyone in now, um, because my dog yeah. just started to show here. They are now very happy because they see the spell on my computer monitor and we need to yell at the screen. Oh my God. So that is what just happened. <laughs> they are uh, a lot tonight. <laughs> You might have also seen Ducky. I had to play with Ducky while you guys were talking. So, um, <laughs> um, all right, cool. So lots of cool stretch goals. Um, some that just are seem to be included and some that look like they'll be add-ons that you can get as well. Um, now, is there anything more to come for fifth season after this, this Kickstarter? Or this yeah. backer kit crowdfunding <laughs> campaign? <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, we have two supplements planned. Uh, the first is called the Stone War Chronicle, and that's basically like essentially an adventure path. Um, cool. So, you know, a long adventure that can keep a group busy um, for, you know, several months Good. Um, or years, depending on how slow you play. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we all um, know that. I'm thinking of that campaign right now where it's like, yeah, that took three years and I thought it would take eight months. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and then um, we're also going to do a book called Ten Rings. Um, and that is specifically about the uh, the trained origins. So they're trained in a place called the Fulcrum. Um, and once they're trained, they have just like a kind of jaw dropping amount of power. Um, you know, where it's like, you can shift a tectonic plate, you know? <laughs> um, so in the core rule book, you can play a wild origin, which means you're untrained. Um, but we didn't think it would really work to have like a starting party where, you know, like one person is, uh, like I'm very resistant to diseases and another person's like, I make a volcano explode. <laughs> <laughs> a little, little OP there. So it's almost like you're getting those like prime characters of those um in this this supplement where you're like okay now you're the the almost like a demigod or something like that like in terms of your powers yeah so it's basically playing on another level and you know cool. you'd play like a fulcrum based campaign and you know with characters or origins or guardians um you know who are the people who keep them in line uh, as Please. it were and are uh, are these um, supplements, are these going to be uh, crowdfunding campaigns of their own? Uh, that's not currently planned, no. Okay, okay. Neat. Uh, I love getting all the behind-the-scenes action from uh, and, and hearing what's coming, so that's really great. Um, anything else that you want to say about fifth season um, before I ask you a little bit of an off-topic question? <laughs> Hiromi, got something to add? Um, just because I forgot to mention it when we were talking about, uh, mechanics, uh, mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, the, the origins, uh, they tie directly in, or at least with ferals, uh, with, uh, untrained origins that ties into the stun system oh, where cool. 
they don't have sort of on tap access to it. They're they're not trained. They can't just be like, well, I can do all of the cool stuff that uh, trained origins can do uh, at, at a whim. They they're using the stunt system. They have to spend stunt points in order to uh, do all of the wild things. So they don't have reliable access to it, but they can uh, do uh, bonkers things that will uh, hopefully be very helpful uh, for you. <laughs> um, one of the things is they can create a hazard uh, in the area. And if you've played any RPGs where there's a static uh, area of effect ability, you know that that's not always helpful. <laughs> Yep, Thunder Wave is uh, is the mm. bane of everyone's existence. <laughs> awesome. Okay, that's really cool. Uh, so my semi-off-topic question is, because the last time we talked, uh, you have a lot of, of crowdfunding projects planned for this year. So I want to kind of give you a chance to um, to push what's coming next. Like, uh, if, if you're not a follower of Green Ronin, what can we expect? Why why should we follow you? <laughs> uh, well, so one crowdfunder we're planning is for a licensed RPG that we haven't yet announced. <gasps> so <laughs> mystery license. <laughs> I just imagine that with like sparkles on it, the, the the phrase where it's like the mystery box or something like that. Like I want it, whatever it is, yeah. now I want it. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've also, this, this won't be a crowdfunder, but, um, we're releasing the second edition of our fantasy age role-playing game, uh, which we've been working on the past several years. Um, and that should be the PDF, um, will become available and the pre-order for the print book will start, um, by the end of the month, um, Great. if all goes correctly. Um, and, uh, you know, last month when all the OGL, shenanigans you know were causing a big shakeup in the industry and all of a sudden people were uh parachuting out of D and looking for alternatives you know we're like hey here we are right <laughs> <With a> proven <laughs> game engine and a new fantasy game so uh if you've been looking for uh a different fantasy rpg check it out awesome um Our Anything else to, to, to pitch? Oh, yeah. Um, Cthulhu Awakens, uh, oh. which was itself a crowdfunder last year, that that will also be coming out. Um, it's just because of the, the the nature of the projects and the difficulties of cash flow. Like, we've ended up in this situation where we haven't released a core rulebook since The Expanse, which was 2018. Um, but this year, we're going to do three. <laughs> <laughs> and they're going to come out in like a four month period, which is ridiculous. But, um, you know, we want to get them out there so people can Absolutely. play. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So it'll be cool. Fantasy Age, Cthulhu Awakens, and then fifth season. Awesome. So, yeah. Lots of stuff. <laughs> Great. So, uh, as kind of a last question before we say goodbye here, um, where can people follow both of you to learn more about Green Ronin and the other projects that you're working on uh, and watch for your work? Uh, I personally am at Primus on Twitter, uh, also on Facebook. Um, the company has a Twitter account uh, at Green Ronin Pub. Uh, that's for all our, our official announcements and things. And uh, the company also has a Facebook page. Awesome. And Hiromi? Um, I... Uh, my website, uh, hiromikota.com, uh, so just my first and last name, uh, and then at hiromikota at uh, mostly on Tumblr these days, although I still have uh, Twitter and TikTok, but I, I'm i not super active on either of those lately uh, because making content for TikTok takes time and I don't have time. Fair. Very fair. <laughs> awesome. Uh, we we never know when Twitter will just disappear because when you're <laughs> a narcissistic so sociopathic billionaire, you might do anything. So <laughs> oh, Twitter. oh, Twitter. I know. <laughs> well, uh, oh. uh, oh, go ahead. Oh. 
I I have to ask uh, Chris if it would be uh, gauche to plug uh, a uh, campaign that's not for Green uh, Green Groning. Oh yeah, sure, go for it. Uh, so Pugmire Second Edition uh, mm -hmm. game where you can be uh, the the best dog or best uh, cat or uh, I don't know how many uh, uh, animal types are available at this point, uh, but yes, you you can make your uh, you can make your dog uh, in a sci-fi but still fantasy setting. Um, it's no longer based on D and D, uh, and I I wrote an adventure and a big chunk of the magic system for that, Ooh. and through bonkers coincidence. Uh, both the fifth season campaign and the Pugmire campaign started the same day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Cool. So that's, uh, feel free to drop the, the link in the chat for us uh, on twitch.tv slash Gen Con TV uh, so that we can jump over and support you there as well. Because uh, who doesn't love more game content? Uh, let's get it all, all over the place. Well, um, yeah. My stepdaughter loves dogs, so when the first Pugmire came around, she was off at college, and uh, and I um, backed the Kickstarter, and I sent her the PDF as soon as it was available, and her response was like, OMG, making characters. Yeah, I was just thinking, uh, how would I set up his superpowers of anxiety? Um, <laughs> how do we use that, huh? Um, but thank you both so much for speaking with me today. Uh, really excited for the success of, uh, of fifth season and what else is to come for Green Ronin. These are good people uh, with a good company. So please support them if you can. And uh, don't go anywhere though, because we will be right back. All right, don't forget that we have a wonderful giveaway of the Blue Rose TTRPG Core Rulebook, which is yeah. romantic fantasy. So if you want to check out a new RPG, in addition to all of the recommendations you've gotten today, because who can have enough, um, then please type in hashtag RemPC in the chat for your free entry to win. And don't forget that you can get bonus entries by donating bits or subscribing to the Gen Con TV channel. Uh, you get an extra entry for every 100 bits or seven entries for subscribing. So you can be a big winner today. Uh, don't forget, we also have Rem Alternus merch at our Etsy store at www.remalternus.com slash Etsy. You can pick up t-shirts, you can pick up comic books, you can pick up patches and stickers and poker chips. There's all kinds of stuff there for you. And uh, that's all for today. So thank you so much for joining. Uh, Shadowrun Emerald Glitch is coming up next. So stay tuned, Rem PCs. Bye.